much. It is a privilege to be here, and thank you, Dr. Chandri, for your vision of putting this convention together. <clears throat> okay. Now, there's a new uh, approach to, and a new format to lecturing. It's a new concept. And I'm going to try it for the second time today, and it's called Pichu Kucha. When I first heard that, I said, boy, you know, it sounds like Machu Picchu. I've been there a few times, so maybe this is Quechuan or, or Inca, but actually it's Japanese. And in Japanese, it means the sound of conversation. So what we're going to do, instead of seeing a lot of stuffy slides full of words that we don't have time to read, I'm going to put you through a, a collage for 25 minutes of visions from the rainforest, some of my travels in the last 17 or 18 years. It will be all timed like 10 or 15 seconds. We'll see the fauna, the flora of the rainforest. We'll see the indigenous healers. We'll see a lot of students. Uh, for 17 years now, I've been working. I was the co-founder of the Student Rainforest Fund. So this is a nonprofit that takes college students studying the health professions to the rainforest each year. So we've done um, trips to Peru, Ecuador, Belize, and Costa Rica. And we're hoping to get to Cuba. A little bit tough there, but it's a great place to go. So anyway, we're going to do that. And um, well, I want to start by the one word I want you to think of today, and it came up so much today, is this word of, you know, Ted said chi, and the word is frequencies and wavelengths and prayers. It's, it's really all the same thing. It's, it's energy. And getting back to Matt's speech, the technology, the technology is, folks, that these things are measurable. And this is very exciting. Now, a week ago, I had my uh, 17th open house at my Nutra Pharmacy, which was very successful. It was a great testimony on what we're doing for the public that they accepted, and they really like coming into our place. So about 17 years ago, I was selling vitamins and herbs and supplements, and I was consulting people who take both drugs and alternative medicines, and I still do. But I think probably 70 to 75% of what I do today is what's called energy medicine. Now, I really feel that this is a big connection with my real passion in life. My real passion in life is actually medicinal plants. So I'm not a botanist. I wouldn't call myself an ethnobotanist, but I do work, refer to myself as an ethnopharmacist sometimes because I'm very interested in the plants that indigenous people used to cure today's ills. And there's still a big reason to go back there. Let's see if I got this right. Which one do I hit? There it is. Okay, real quick on a couple of energy machines. You don't have to read all that. But the two that I use mostly, the Etascan, it's a German-Swiss machine, came out about six years ago. This is wonderful technology. And for the first time, we've all heard of things like Rife machines. Well, this is on the shoulder of the Rife machine. It's just as new cell phones versus old cell phones, big differences. And what this machine will do with earphones is pick up the frequencies of your organs. Just like all your friends have a different voice, you can pick up their frequency. Five million cell phones find each other, different frequencies, music's a frequency. Well, our heart and our liver and our colon, our brain, our thyroid all have a, a frequency. Well, of course, it's measurable. So we can pick up the energetic health of these things. But in the system, in the program, are hundreds and hundreds of frequencies. The system can distinguish accurately the different frequency between lead, mercury, and cadmium, dandelions and daisies, strep and staph, mold and fungus, to a degree, cancer and diabetes, they can find it. And what do we do with it? Well, we're trying to look at balance, balancing the energetic fields of organs, and it works very well. What we cannot say is cure, we're not curing anything. We're balancing organs, and when organs function more optimally, they function more optimally. I was listening to an NPR report coming in, and there was a, a new word that I think we're gonna hear a lot in the future, it's called biomatrix. And if you think, uh, what's the next technology since we've had, you know, computers, the internet, these iPhones, the next one is going to be these wristwatches and these wristbands that are going to take every frequency of your body. You're going to have your complete cardiovascular frequencies there, your emotional, your psychological, your immune system, it's all going to be right in the band. And that's what's coming in the next couple of years. So frequencies are incredible things. And the fact that they're measurable, this is what it's all about. My newest machine is called the Oligoscan. I just picked it up at the anti-aging program. It was out in Vegas in December. This is a French machine. This machine also is a frequency machine, just picks up frequencies from your palm, the little wand, because your organs of elimination is your skin. 
And what it can find, a little bit different than the scan, is it'll tell us what your mineral levels are very accurately. Minerals are m much more important than vitamins. We're made of minerals, not vitamins. Plus heavy metals, mercury, lead, cadmium, problems. And then it has correlations of organs like what is our hormonal balance, our enzyme balance, intestinal balance. Do we have predisposition to diabetes or allergies? It can tell us all these things. One of my great mentors is Thomas Rao. He's a rheumatologist from Switzerland. And he has a clinic called the Paracelsus Clinic. And I just got certified last March in this. And what Dr. Rao would say, because we've talked so much today about you know, the approaches to chronic diseases, and I'm not here to dismiss allopathic medicine, psychiatry, drugs and medicine, surgery, they're, they're doing wonderful. Not, not many people do psychiatry like Dr. Chandri, but it's been around a long time, very sophisticated. But what Dr. Rao would say, what are the three most likely causes of chronic diseases that our doctors won't find because they're not trained to find them? They're not disingenuous, they're just not trained. And that would be heavy metal toxins, parasites, number one, mold and fungus, big issues in our society. That's another lecture for another time. Let's talk about how this coincides to what I call green pharmacy. You know, many synchronicities come into our life. It's, you know, the energy of you people here is people are in a holistic field and you care about it. And this happened to me back in the early 90s when I had a chance to go to Peru in the rainforest. And, you know, I don't believe in coincidences in life, but I really got interested because I had a regular apothecary pharmacy for years. And I was really kind of a natural guy. I, I was an environmentalist and I wanted to kind of meld the two. And this gave me my chance. So I saw this little ad in a pharmacy magazine back in 93. First ever pharmacy of the rainforest through the American Botanical Council, which is probably one of the best herbalist sort of research uh, entities here in the, in the States down in Austin. So I got to go. And, but, you know, I, I kind of didn't know where to start. I said, I, I want to change my practice. I want to change my career. I don't know where to start. I don't know what products to carry. I don't know where to begin. Well, of course, you run into these teachers who open new doors, just like we can do as we get older and more you know, skilled in our certain um, disciplines, we teach other people. But you know, this invokes to me the rudimentary beginnings of our health profession. Whether we go back to medicine or pharmacy, what did the elders do? You know, Chinese medicine was brought up, the Persians, the Egyptians, Middle East, the indigenous people from North America, South America. They used the roots and the herbs and the fruits and the essential oils and the leaves or whatever of their days to heal people. And it worked for many, many centuries, okay? Now this has evolved to this modern medical phenomena we call the pharmaceutical revolution, but there's this move to go back, back to nature. And this is what I'm concerned about, and this is kind of what my passion is. You know, if you watched the news the other night, I think Dr. O'Neill mentioned this morning, we got big problems with antibiotic resistance, big problems. And I'll tell you, if you have C. diff and MRSA, you don't have much hope because, you know, Vanco doesn't work, you better say your prayers. I would tend to trust uh, certain herbs and certain other homeopathics for these conditions today than I would taking certain drugs that you have to take for a long time. There was a fella in the news who had cancer and C. diff, and he said, doctor, please leave my cancer alone, cure my C. diff, you know, going to the bathroom eight, ten, ten times a day, and what would he have for that? Benko. So there's this move to go back to nature, and the pharmaceutical companies are a little bit involved. I don't always trust them because I've learned not to, but they're the movers and shakers, so we have, to, we have to recognize that. But there's some wonderful traditional healers still out there, and we're on the precipice. If we don't garner this knowledge in the next 20 years, it's going to be lost. This great shaman, of, uh, and I've had probably not even close to the experience with indigenous people that uh, Dr. Melmadroma has, but I've had a good relationship with at least 11 or 12 shamans over the years. And, you know, even though it was a short time, we have incredible knowledge. The great shaman of Belize, Panty, died in 2000 at the age of 103, and I got to see him when he was like, you know, still kind of living but not practicing when he was probably 100 years old. And I remember some of the things he did because his apprentice was Rosita Arviga, who was one of my teachers also, and I take the students to Belize to see her all the time. She's an American who went down there, and she became his apprentice. But the problem was that he was had this knowledge of 10,000 plants in his brain, but he didn't know how to read or write. So if he dies and his sons or daughters or grandsons don't learn this from tradition, the library burned out. These people have incredible knowledge. And 
we, we look at this frequency thing, and I remember him saying, you know, when, I, when I'm perplexed, I have this disease or this condition I can't treat, I go out into the forest, and I listen to the plants, and the plants talk to me, and they tell me, that's the right plant for this condition. Now, why would somebody make that up? So it's very authentic. So we're gonna look a little bit into that. I like this picture because it kind of evokes this natural medicine coming from you know, a common dosage form. Capsules, we all take capsules, right? So this movement to go back, I think, is, is authentic. Folks, the age of antibiotics is over. You can believe what you want, but it's over. It was wonderful in the 70s, the 80s, but these problems with resistance is a big issue today. One of the things I find in my energy machine, which is most disconcerting, it's a whole other lecture, and seven out of 10 people have it, Roundup. This nasty pesticide, thank you Monsanto, that's all over. There's just a study in the Mississippi Valley, 70% of the rain and the croplands have pesticides, have Roundup. I don't know if it causes cancer, diabetes, and heart disease, I can't tell you that. But I'll tell you one thing I do know. Number one, I want to know if it's in my food, but we're not allowed. Number two is it's a nerve disruptor. It's a neuron disruptor. So you think about people who might have Parkinson's or epilepsy or other nervous conditions. Is anybody looking for these things? They're not. So basic facts quickly is just that, you know, there's about a quarter million species of plants that are logged that, you know, we have identified. But only 2% of these have ever been investigated for possible cancer use or anything else. And, you know, 20 or 25% of all those drugs behind the counter drug stores still come from natural sources or semi-natural sources. So it's still big business. Now, all these 70% of these, you know, a lot of them come from the rainforest. 3,000 have come from the rainforest. And, you know, they have possible, you know, they take them into the test tube and some of them have positive assays for something like cancer or diabetes or some incurable thing. Now, alkaloids, if you're a chemist or you're a um, pharmacist or a doctor, you took a lot of chemistry. You know, and alkaloids are just this part of the plant that seems to elicit a, a chemical effect. You know, insects use them. Now the insects are getting smarter because of the pesticides because they keep mutating. A good example of this would be everybody heard of St. John's wort. Everybody knows it's used for mild to moderate depression. But what part of the St. John's wort plant, stem, root really works? Nobody knows. They suspect it's hypericum. But there's 109 different alkaloids in St. John's work. So who would know these things? Well, maybe the indigenous person uh, who's been working with them for centuries through the generations has a real feeling about what they can use for diarrhea or fungal infections, some things that we really have problems with. We've all heard of these things. We'll talk about them maybe at the end after this collage of pictures. We'll have a little fun, and we'll talk about the 10 top herbal medicines of all time. All these have great folklore, they have great stories. We don't have time to talk to them all. Maybe we'll talk about a few of them, but you know, we all heard about Digitalis, Taxol, I think Lewis mentioned that this morning from the Pacific yew tree. The bark of the tree was where it was derived, but you needed like kilos and kilos of bark to make this much Taxol. So it was non-sustainable. So what happened? Well, they found Taxoterol, which is from the pine needles in the European pine. Well, yeah, pine trees, are all over the place. So it was a less, pro it was a, you know, wasn't a problem because it wasn't sustainable. It was sustainable more so than did chincona bark. And the indigenous people used this bark centuries ago for kidney disease and other things. Aspirin, cortisol, you know, what's the two probably most famous drugs of last century that all came from the Mexican yam, one plant. Prednisone, cortisol, and the birth control pill. Morphine's still probably unsurpassed for pain management in some cases. And some of these aren't uh, as well known. Reserpine was kind of big when I was a pharmacist back in the uh, early 70s, but it's not used for blood pressure much anymore. And metformin, still the cornerstone for diabetes, came from a plant, the goat's root. A little bit about our student rainforest fund. Now you can look online, I don't want to talk much about it. Okay, so I just heard the other day, I was driving along, and every time I get in the car, I get some grief from my wife because I just put on six, 60s on 6. I said, I can't help it. You know, I went to high school in the 60s, and I'm a child of the 60s, and I just listened to it. But the DJ was saying, you know, um, the other day, there was a town or a city, I think it was in either Minnesota or Michigan, but they voted to eliminate Columbus Day, and they're going to name it Indigenous People's Day. 
I'm like, I'm all for that, so maybe the country should pick that up, but that's a good idea. So let's talk about these indigenous. Now, as you see these pictures, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, you have the notes. We don't have to refer to the notes. I'm gonna tell you a little a few stories about some of these products. They're still very valid today, whether they're prescription or not, isn't all that important. Here is a trio. He's from Southern Suriname, or he would be from Colombia. One of the products that I still use in my practice, and I'm going to talk a little bit about those because they're still relevant to uh, my practice, Una de Gata. Una de Gata is the vine of life. It's one of these panacea plants that have so many uses. Back in this 80s, we all remember the AIDS epidemic, and there wasn't a lot of drugs out there at first. Well, the underground drug was Una de Gata because it had an immune stimulant effect to immune suppressed problem. Quinine, chincona bark, one of the great drugs. What's the biggest killer in the history of man? Second today, malaria. Okay, so here we have the bark of the chicon tree. Now, there's been resistance to it, and it's not working like it did a half a century ago, but just think what the world needed. Now, this is a great example of how prejudice and bias can play such a big role in healthcare. Okay, the story goes that back in the 16th century, the Jesuits were in South America to convert the Indians, of course. Well, somehow they found very serendipitously, I'm sure, that when they either drank the tea from this bark or swam in that water, they didn't get malaria. Well, they were pretty excited about this find, and they went find, and they went back to their abbey in London with this great news that they may have a cure for malaria. Ah, but there were problems. It was also the time of the Protestant revolution, revolution or resolution, I should say, whatever, and the Catholics didn't trust the Protestants, and the Protestants didn't trust the Catholics very much. So here was this great knowledge that was held up for like 200 years until two French pharmacists actually came back out in the 1800s about the benefit of that. And that could still happen today. We could find somebody who doesn't have an education, finding a tuber in the rainforest in Africa or South America that can knock cancer out of the, out of the test tubes, but it's gonna take 15 to 20 years before it has to go through the process, right? Well, we have to be careful of that because it can still happen today. Paul de Arco is a um, Brazilian plant. We still use it for fungal infections. You can actually use the tea bags and put it on fungal infections. I do use it in IBS in some cases. Maca roots are popular again. You know, maca is a, from the potato family, from the Peruvian uh, Andes. And of course, it's used for a little virility, so it might be one of these, uh, you know, alternatives to Viagra or something like that, but even more than that, it can, it can actually balance hormones for both men and women. Now the wild yam was the, um, the one I was telling you that from Mexico and from Belize, which was used for uh, cortisone in the birth control pill, and another wonderful story. So uh, Dr. Marker, back in 1940s, he was a physician, and at that time, diastrogen, which was the only um, which was used to make the birth control pill. The only source in the world was the glands of yaks. You know those big hairy things up in the Arctic? Well, how, much, how many yak glands could you get? Well, he found when he was down in Central America that um, this yam plant possibly produced this diastrogen. And he found one day a bunch of women back in the forest and they were all kind of giggling and laughing and giggling and laughing. And he kept bugging me, he says, what, what you, why are you leaving the men and going back here? And she said, get away from us, good one. So he kept bugging them enough and they said, well, we'll tell you, but you have to promise two things. You won't tell the men and you'll never come back here again. Well, they were chewing on the tubers of this, yeah. And of course, it kept them infertile for like six months. He takes this plant back, goes to the laboratory, Cyril Labs, which was the first one to produce a, uh, the birth control pill, gave this guy something like $75,000 a year back in 1940. Well, here, another story from the rainforest, right? Now, two of the ones that are my favorite because I use them so well in my practice, and I certainly didn't discover them, but I, I certainly utilize them a lot, is red gumbo limbo bark, which I mix with aloe vera and vitamin E for a salve for psoriasis and eczema. It does extremely well. I think a lot of the derms in North Hills know about it, but they won't admit it. And then there's jackass bitters, and it sort of has this name that it's so bitter that you have to be a jackass to drink it, right? But it's a, it's a wonderful herb that Rosita would say was the one that kept her in the rainforest without getting parasites. If you live long enough in a rainforest, 100% of us are going to get parasites. Just like the Etiscan tells us, 100% of us have heavy metals. There's no exceptions. So the word today is like detoxification, right? 
we're not allowed to use that word. The medical profession is almost going to put the, the jinx on this word that because they've never defined it, you're going to have a problem putting that this supplement may be a detox agent, but that's another story also. So anyway, this is, a, this is my ace in a hole. When I really have tough parasites, because I can identify uh, Cladosporum and Musa racemus and Aspergillus and Malalaceae. These are not the common guys like Candida, and they're tough sometimes. There's a wonderful story about the um, Myrtha, which was the big lowland gorilla in the Pittsburgh Zoo a few years ago, and had horrible diarrhea. And I knew one of the uh, curators over there, and she used to come in, and she said, you know, all the vets, they don't know what to do with this, this uh, gorilla. Do you want to try maybe that Jack has bitters? And I said, well, sure, I'll mix it up, I'll give it free. So I mix them up a batch because it took them like months to get this approved by all the doctors and so forth. So I give them this batch and they look at it and say, well, we can't give them this, it has alcohol in it. I said, well, of course it has alcohol. All homeopathic tinctures have alcohol. This gorilla's worth $300,000. We're not going to give it any alcohol. Okay. So I called Rosita and Belize. I says, what else can I do? I, how else do you mix this stuff? She says, well, maybe try apple cider vinegar. Okay. So I tried it with apple cider vinegar. So here's this gorilla and they're kind of masking it in bananas and all these apples and everything. And within a couple weeks, he's not having diarrhea every day. It's like every other day, right? And of course, they're always looking for this certain bacteria. Then in about three months later, it's, it's pretty stable. And he's at a plateau. And he said, what should we do? I says, double the dose. Well, of course, they had to go back to committee to double the dose. Well, the story ends that after a couple, he wouldn't take it anymore because it was so horribly tasty, but he was he cleared up. And today, that same gorilla is out at the San Diego Zoo, and I still hear that he's doing fine. Okay. Now, kapal is a very interesting herb. It's a, you know we talked a lot today about spirituality. Well, this is the herb of the spiritual approach, especially among the Maya. You know they have deep religious beliefs. They 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 meld their Catholicism very closely with their traditional beliefs about the four winds and Ixchel, the the goddess of healing and a goddess of the forest and all these things. So Kapal is a, an herb that they would use for somebody who's dying, okay? They're very into numerology and they believe a lot into the nine spirits or the nine days that you have to pray after somebody dies. So Kapal could be used for that. So warding off evil spirits and a lot of these people believe in that. Um, salt palmetto, probably one of the most researched herbs on the planet, we know a lot about that. Cayenne pepper, we see a lot. That's um, you know, we think these red hot cayenne things are really good for circulation. Of course, we know that that's a cream that's used for arthritis and so forth. Garan is kind of making a comeback. It's used for maybe weight loss. Of course, it's, it's a caffeine. It's a stimulant. So, you know, if you stimulate the uh, immune system and the uh, thyroid a little bit, you know, it may decrease your appetite a little bit. Lemon balm is still widely used for topical creams, even though it has been used for babies who might have colic but they still use it in a cream for like herpes sores and it probably works as well as, as, as saclovar. Lemongrass sometimes uses a tea. I've seen it used as an insect repellent mostly, but sometimes it's been used for maybe a remedy for somebody who had too much to drink last night and has a hangover. Now, some of the drugs that we know, these are not prescription drugs that have come from nature. AZT, let's get back to AIDS. You know, that was the first one approved by the FDA back in 1987, still widely used. This came from the Bergman sponge, Caribbean sponge, synthesized uh, into the treatment for herpes. Lovastatin, everybody talks about statin drugs. What's the original Mevacor? Well, this comes from a mushroom, and it was come from a fungus. Red yeast rice, we've heard about that. Well, Merck picks up on this, and what did they make from the red yeast rice? They made Mevacor, which is the first blockbuster statin back in the 80s. Well, now we have Lipitor and Zocor and all these other ones came from nature. What about Coumadin? We all know part about the blood thinners. This is another natural product. A German scientist derived dicumarol from the clover called a conundrum. It's a synthetic analog today, but it's a life-saving anticoagulant and prevents treatment and is used for prevention treatment of pulmonary embolisms and thrombosis. Taxol, I think uh, Lewis mentioned that today. Well, Taxol was probably still uh, a billion dollar drug and still probably the drug of choice for breast cancer and uterine cancer. Now, curare, I don't think there'd be a, a hospital in the country without curare, which is derived from a South American moonseed species. And of course, it's used in anesthesia to relax a patient's skeletal muscle system and surgery of all types. 
What I found when I was in southern Suriname with Mark Plotkin a couple years ago, this is really one of those places where there was like no running water and no toilets and so forth. It was a great experience for me, but I was talking to this shaman and he, he said, well, there's like six species of curare. We don't just use one. I said, well, I didn't know that. Of course, they use the curare as a spin poison. So you take this and you put it on the tip of the arrow or they use darts down there. And of course, when you hit the monkey, the monkey dies of a heart attack because if you put too much curare, you're gonna kill the patient, but just the right dose. You know, we call that narrow therapeutic index like lanoxin and coumadin, very effective. Anyway, I remember saying to this guy through an interpreter, I says, well, you know, if I had like incurable cancer and I came to see you and I had six months to live, what would you do for me? He said, well, that's pretty tough. He said, I'd send you to Colombians. Those guys are really good. That's what he said. <laughs> so it's funny. Um, one of the things that um, Pygeum bark, which is used a lot with salt palmetto, we use it a lot in our practice for uh, prostate hypertrophy, quite effective, as effective as probably Flomax and some of the drugs. Shea nuts, a, a recent discovery. This is a nut that grows in Nigeria. And of course, the people use it there for uh, food and so forth. But um, it's also a good joint anti-inflammatory. Now we're mixing it with glucosamine with some pretty good effects. Mutterbur has been around a long time, you know, for long-term migraine treatment. It seems to be effective, but it's not for acute attacks. One of the great drugs, aloe vera. We've all heard about aloe for burns and so forth, but of course a lot of people take it internally for IBS, and it really coats the mucous membranes. When I was in Cuba, one of the most exciting places for natural medicine because these people have incredible knowledge, but they don't have the modern technology. But they've been forced because of these crazy embargoes for years to use a lot of their natural plants. So they use polycosinol for cholesterol. And they use aloe for eyes. They make it into an injection for arthritis and also make an eye preparation with it. Some of the miracle drugs from Africa, we can talk a little bit about there, is vermonia. Now, how would you have a pet or a zoo or a farm without a natural product to get rid of pesticides, uh, to get rid of, uh, you know, uh, Parasites, right? <laughs> so here's a widely used today an animal for uh, anti-parasitic agent, and of course a lot of the veterinary companies still use this. Chloramphenicol, one of the early antibiotics, came from a sponge, a soil, from soil fungus. And of course it was used for other antibiotics that resisted. Then Christine, then Blastine. This came from Madagascar. <coughs> still the only chemo drug on the market it's about 97% effective in childhood leukemia. Only one that's that effective. Came from that rosy periwinkle that you saw there a couple slides ago. Cyclosporin, you know, we're putting that in eyes now for Rustacea. Well, this is basically uh, from a cordyceps fungus, first discovered on Earth and searched uh, in South America. But it was used, off, obviously we use some of these drugs for transplants today. Still, it's very important for people who have kidney, lung, or heart transplants. How about Keflex? We've all heard of cephalosporin, okay? This is another drug that became important because of penicillin resistance back in the 60s. Turmeric, well, we know the, the, one of the greatest spices on the planet is turmeric, and uh, we use it so much in our practice. We think it has not only anti-inflammatory, it's anti-cancer, it's, it's an immune suppressant or immune stimulant, but it's also an adaptogen, right? Helps us adapt to stressors. And I don't mean just emotional stress. That's a big factor. It's the biggest factor. But what about the stress from pesticides and herbicides? You know, all these things that we talked about, oxidative stress. We can measure these things now. This is exactly what these machines do. We can look in the body and say, what's your level of oxidative stress? What's your, are you a retainer or are you an excreter? And that's really important because 100% of us have heavy metals. You can walk out here and get in your car and the bus goes by with a bunch of fumes. You just breathe in some toxins. Is it cancerous? I don't know, maybe it is. But the point is your body's immune system is, doesn't get rid of it and the body stores it, you got problems over time. So being an excreter is extremely important. Uh, one of my newsletters and one of the best ways to excrete, is just good old exercise and sweating. But we think chlorella is the universal. So we really go with chlorella a lot too. Miracle drugs, we mentioned metformin. Wonderful drug still I think works. Just if you're on metformin, remember you deplete B12 a lot. Uh, some other new drugs that uh, recently, uh, back in 2008, Spiriva got approved by the FDA. This is for bronchospasms. 
And this is an alkaloid from a fruit that came from Southeast Asia. Uh, Tagacil, which is a new antibiotic released by Wyeth in 2007 for treating complicated skin infections, especially methicillin-resistant staph, we were talking about that before, vanco-resistant staph, uh, and this comes from a rainforest plant also. So, you know, the stories go on and on about this folklore, and all I'm saying is I'm not, you know, naive enough to think we're going to get a shaman in one of our local hospitals to treat uh, fungal infections. It's not going to happen. But that's not the point. The point is that there's still people out there who need to look into these things because, you know, the, the wisdom is there. You, you have, it's just like your great grandma who had this wonderful remedy for PMS or diarrhea or when you had, you know, headaches or something like that. Well, there's a lot of going on with that. And I think in time, we have to recognize that these things need to be documented because they aren't in some cases. And I think there's a lot of value to that. And as soon as we get through these couple slides, that's the red gumbo limbo bark, which, uh, as you can see, this is called the doctrine of signatures. And the doctrine of signatures, I can't scientifically prove, but people believe it all the time. And what they believe is that God gave them a clue as to how to use the plant. So we see a red bark, and it's for what? Sunburn. It's for eczema. It's for psoriasis, OK? The um, foxglove is the leaf that brought us lenoxin. What's lenoxin? For the heart, right? And the leaf is the shape of a heart. So this is very interesting stuff, even though it's not scientific. We, uh, they recognize it a lot, and I think it's interesting stuff, the story. So when we get through these couple slides, we'll talk about the top 10, what I'd say, plant medicines that uh, we've been using for a long time. I guess I was running a little late. Okay, we got some time because I think this runs 25 minutes. Anybody have any quick questions? Yes, dear. Yeah, black cumin, yeah. And we're using that for allergies quite a bit. Black cumin today, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, Nigeria is a whole different part. I've done many missions to Nigeria, and you've got different practitioners there. But it's kind of interesting how they coincide with some of the South Americans. Remember when the, the slave trade was going on, many of the ships didn't just come to America, they went to Central and South America. So a lot of these slaves who broke away, they went into the forest. And when I went into some of the forest in Suriname, Brazil, it was like, I felt like I was in Africa. It's, it's these big black people with Dutch names, right? Because it's been Dutch Guiana where they went. They still use a lot of the uh, traditional medicines. And it's kind of interesting if someone would do a PhD or some sort of thesis on how do they connect with the Africans and the ones who are now in South America and so forth. This guy's name's Ali. He's about 90 years old. And he's saying to me, he says, um, then I, I can cure AIDS in the early stages. I said, well, you know, that's interesting. Will you want to show me what you use? He said, well, I would. And of course, he has his herbalist um, license from the government of Nigeria. So I take students, and that's my daughter there on the left. We did some diabetic work here in Nigeria a few years ago, hoping to go back in August if all that trouble doesn't get worse over there. But anyway, he said, um, I said, well, no, I'm not here to doubt that. Can you show me the plan? He said, well, it's about an hour's drive. I can't show you. He, I said, well, it's fine. And he says, but I'll tell you one thing for sure. And he says, um, I don't charge my patient unless it works. It would be wonderful if the American doctors would pick up on that a little bit. Huh? I won't charge unless it works. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed some of these slides. With uh, these are the Bedouins. This is up, the, up near Lake Chad in northern Nigeria. My daughter went with me. She's a nurse out in California. It was a great experience. And now that she has a little three-year-old, I don't think she's going to go anymore. But these people are just wander through the desert. And we do do um, blood sticks there because some of these hospitals don't have glucometers and things like that. And um, so we do leave the hospitals as many strips as we can. And um, this is a group that uh, I've also worked with, which is more for health professionals. If anybody's ever interested in doing some real work in the bush in Africa, you can come with me sometimes. Some of these you know, Muslim villages where the women sit on one side and the men on the other, but they're so appreciative that they see Americans. You know, they, uh, they just think, wow, I can't believe you'd come over and help us. And of course, most people like Americans. This is a, a, a turban ceremony that they gave me an honor in this one town where I became a uh, chief, which is kind of a nice honor. But, um, you know, sort of like Americans are kind. They all think that Americans all have swimming pools and Cadillacs, unfortunately. So 
Anyway, it's, uh, it's a great um, thing to do service because I think we're all on the planet to do service. Any other questions? All right, well, real quick, we'll just go through these top 10. Can't be much longer unless our guy wants to click on it. You see that? Some of these, okay, so here we go. Top 10 drugs that change the world. I think I'll click it. So number 10, go through, okay? We talked about this amazing drug, metformin, still a cornerstone for drug therapy. It just had their 50th anniversary in 2008. It was discovered up in Washington State. There's a big monument to the discovery of glucophon. The Mexican yam, we said two of the great drugs, marker uh, 1945, and of course that's a uh, birth control pill, and we said cortisol, and that's the Mexican yam. And you can see this is a big doctor of signatures. This is Rosita Ardiga. If you see the plant, the tuber is the shape of a vagina, but all the roots coming out are like, look like arthritic arms. Why? Because prednisone is used for rheumatoid arthritis. Curare, we talked about the, uh, how it's indispensable for certain types of surgery. That's a picture of it. Rosie Periwinkle was the plant where the Christine, the Blastine, has been derived. 95% effect for Hodgkin's. Started in 1950, a bunch of uh, English scientists were in Madagascar. And of course, up in the north, they found these Indians using this. Native Americans, whatever, would say they're not a Native American natives using it for kidney disease. Mm -hmm. Picture of it. It grows all over the world now. Taxo tree we talked about, $2 billion drug. That's the bark, not a good shot. Opium, well, we still have to consider morphine, codeine, some of these uh, unsurpassed morphine for pain management. Morphine was discovered by a man up in uh, Sweden. He was walking through a bog and found this little bit of fungus covered back in the laboratory, discovered it. Poppy seeds. Aloe. I think aloe is going to have a big future, too, for many other reasons. What happened? Battery died. Battery died. Okay. All right, anybody want to guess what some of the other ones are? What's the number one everybody knows about? Aspirin, of course. Yeah, that's when it would be number one. And uh, yeah, number two was Lenoxin, okay? So dead jobs. Okay, well, thank you very much. I really enjoyed coming. I hope you enjoyed. Oh.